Yeah, so my name is Joe Grand. Thank you guys for, for coming here. Um, I am a hardware hacker, product designer, um, design electronics and hack on stuff and use computers. So just sort of grew up uh, in the hacker community. Um, I was part of a hacker group in the early 90s called The Loft, which was one of the first to sort of discover vulnerabilities and force vendors to try to fix the problem. So we were you know, young and dumb and didn't have any sort of fear of getting sued by companies or, or pissing anybody off or anything. And um, it ended up working out pretty well. None of us went to jail over, over it. Um, but we did, we did kind of open up vendors' eyes to the fact that, oh, there you know, are possibilities of security problems. And yes, people can hack our systems, whether it's software on the software side or on the hardware side or on the network side. Um, and uh, that sort of rolled into what we see now as like the full disclosure debate or responsible disclosure debate or whatever, you know, whatever you have. Um, but that was sort of fun. So I've always been involved in electronics. And uh, professionally, I do two things. One is I design products, usually uh, mostly consumer electronics and, and modules for electronics hobbyists. So open source hardware projects that people can use for building blocks for like their other stuff, um, for their own projects, robotics, and whatever. Uh, but then on the other side, because of my hacking background, I um, teach a lot of, give a lot of talks and, and, and teach a training class on hardware hacking and reverse engineering. So I get to see both sides, sort of the design side and, where, and what designers have to face on a day-to-day -day basis as they're worried about getting products to market um, and having things work. They're not worried about security uh, for the most part. And then from the hacker side, sort of seeing what people are doing, kind of state of the art. So this, this talk is mostly on the hacking side. Um, this one is uh, a talk that, you know, a, a talk about tools is sometimes people are like, oh, it's a tools talk. I don't, I don't want to just see a list of tools. Um, so this is basically a list of tools uh, with some examples. So at least you know if, if, you, if you're just getting into hardware hacking, this would be a good way, a good place to start. Um, I've given this talk once before that was just called Tools of the Hardware Hacking Trade, and I thought it would be fun for this conference to do an open source Tools of the Hardware Hacking Trade, which is basically the same uh, with some additions of some, some specifically open source things designed by the open source community that we can use as hackers to analyze products and modify products and things like that. Um, so as you'll see, for the most part, there's, you know, there, there's as much open source as I could sort of find, and I'm sure there's things that I missed, uh, but the real goal is just to expose you to lots of different tools. Not all of them are gonna be needed for every sort of hardware attack um, or hardware experiment, but it's uh, you know, just something, something to use as a starting point, which I guess I should ask, uh, how many of you people have any hardware hacking experience, a little bit, soldering, opening stuff up? Cool, software? People, <laughs> yeah, awesome. Okay, I tried to write a software tool once, and uh, it, it ended miserably. <laughs> so okay, so yeah, we'll we'll go into this talk with hardware hacking. The the thing is really the process isn't much different than if you were hacking a piece of software or hacking you know a, a application or something. It's just using different tools. It's that same mindset of all right, let's look inside. Just like we let's look inside the program, let's look inside the piece of hardware. Once we're there, let's you know, reverse engineer a, a, a function in the code. Um, on the hardware side, it's like, all right, let's figure out what that circuitry is doing. Let's see if we can start communicating with it. As you'll see, a lot of the systems now, um, in the examples I show you, are embedded systems, which basically are general purpose computers inside of a product with a microcontroller running some code. So in the grand scheme of things, it really, hardware devices these days aren't much different than a normal computer. Uh, sometimes systems are even running Linux. A lot of systems are running Linux these days, which open them up to all sorts of problems, not only from the hardware side, but also, as you probably know, on the software side. Uh, but then there are some that are sort of these standalone state machines, or maybe they're running some other real-time operating system. But really, you know, we're, we're just looking at computers. We're looking at small computers. So the process is very similar. Um, back in the day, it was a lot harder to find tools to actually do this stuff. When I was a kid, as part of the loft, we would go to uh, walk the halls of Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT in Boston, where I grew up. Um, where people, you know, labs would just throw away equipment and they didn't need it anymore. And it's like, oh, let's use that. Let's use this old oscilloscope. Let's, you know, build our own computer and use that. So it was much harder to get stuff. Nowadays, because of the DIY community, because of the open source hardware community and software community, um, getting, getting most of the tools you need to start analyzing products and hacking on stuff is, is, is easy. And you can build your own a lot of times too. So it really has changed in the past 10, 15 years. So it's pretty awesome. Um, it's just super easy to get the tools and start tinkering with stuff right away. Uh, if you don't have 
certain types of equipment. I don't, I don't talk about them in this class, but there's a lot of people that are now um, getting into chip hacking, so, so decapping, removing the lids of the actual silicon chips themselves, getting access to the die, and then using equipment, basically like, I, I shouldn't really say this, like a soldering iron for, for chips, but using a focused ion beam machine um, to modify traces on the actual silicon, to remove layers of silicon, they're using like fuming nitric acid and crazy stuff. So sort of chip, uh, like, you know, electronics hacking, but at a super small chip level. Um, and stuff like that, like most people don't have access to that equipment. Um, another, another thing that you can do a lot of times is imaging products and like stick them in an x-ray machine. Most people don't have an x-ray machine. There's like a handful of people I know that do in their house. But most people don't, right? So it's like, all right, where do we go? Go to the dentist, go to the doctor. There's probably somebody you know that works at a university or goes to PSU or somebody that has access to x-ray. So you can always outsource. Um, but it's really all about knowing like what tools are available and what the process is so you can sort of go after that. Um, so let's see. I have one slide on just the general process. Uh, this is something that, that in, in a larger kind of two-day hardware hacking class I talk about uh, this process. And I always thought about like, how do I explain what I, what I, the way I do it? And it's like, all right, I'm gonna just sit here and first I gather information, so try to get information about the, about the piece of hardware I'm working with, take it apart. So that's one thing is trying to figure out how to open it, find out where the interesting circuitry is, identify the components, put together a block diagram of where things go. Because from there, you can then say, okay, well the microcontroller is talking to memory. Maybe I wanna try to extract the contents of memory. Maybe I wanna listen in on the communications between two chips. So when you can visually see what's going on, that makes it a lot easier. And we'll talk about you know, some of the tools used for these things. Um, interfaces, so things that are connected to the outside world, say it's a USB port, serial, Firewire, whatever, anything accessible to the outside world, we could possibly use to monitor, to create tools, to inject data. I'll show you an example of that. Um, and then we're looking at internal interfaces as well. So debug interfaces, things that are put on circuit boards by engineers and by manufacturers that they don't expect somebody to open up the product and say, oh, look, there are some test points that I can use to solder onto and reprogram the, the memory or things like that. Um, so we can take advantage of all of that. Uh, firmware extraction is another one because these are mostly embedded systems that have memory of some sort. Uh, we want to try to extract that, that we can use some kind of software firmware reverse engineering techniques to start going through program code and figure out program flow and what things are happening. Again, not all of these are necessary all the time, but this is just sort of the general kind of flow. And then chip level stuff that I talked about. Um, so for this talk, we'll talk about two, the, the tools mostly for these two things, but it's kind, of a, a, it's kind of larger than this. As you'll see, like some of the monitoring analysis tools are also used for injecting data or spoofing data and things like that. But I just wanted to try to categorize it in some way. So we'll look at signal monitoring and analysis. So basically like if we get access to an external interface or somewhere on the circuit board, what tools do we use to st start listening in on communication? It's sort of like Wireshark on a network, right? It's that sort of thing, using those tools to get data and then we have to usually take it a step further and try to figure out what that data actually means. And then manipulation and injection. So once we have an interface or we see something, try to put something into the system or cause the system to fail in some way that then will we'll defeat security. And I have examples for, for most of the stuff, but not all. Um, I could talk about this stuff for days, but I had to cram it into 45 minutes, so we'll see. Um, so yeah, the oscilloscope. Anyone used this oscilloscope before? Cool, yeah, so these, this is my favorite tool of all time. Uh, and what it basically does is gives you an, a visual um, uh, view of what a signal is doing at a particular point in time. Um, and I'll show, you a, I'll show you an example on, on the next slide of that. And uh, this is basically what, what you start when you're probing a board or when you get access to a circuit board. One of the first things, at least that I do, is I'll visually look on the board and see if there's anything interesting like a connector or test points. But then I wanna see what those signals actually are. And the oscilloscope is the best way to do it because it will, in real time, show you what a signal is doing. If it's a steady state signal, or if it's a square wave, or if it's some weird analog signal, or if it's like a, you know audio output or whatever, we would see that. Um, and that would give us a clue about what points on the circuit board are interesting to go to the next step. Um, so there's some standalone ones. This is the one that I use, a, a, a very not open um, Agilent oscilloscope. And, uh, that's more of an engineering focus. And you'll see actually a lot of these tools are basically engineering tools that normal design engineers use that we can use as hackers. Um, there's some PC-based ones. 
that there's more than this, but these are ones that I've used and that I kind of have some good faith in. Um, PropScope is one made by a company called Parallax who makes a lot of open source uh, hardware and educational electronics and stuff. This one is sort of slow, but it's a good kind of hobbyist one to get into. Uh, the hardware is totally open source. It runs on a, uh, a propeller processor, which is their own processor that they made that's this crazy eight core, multi-core kind of really fun processor that they also are the first company to fully open source that chip. So I think it's all either in VHDL or Verilog. You can take their source for that microcontroller, load it into an FPGA and run it. Um, so it truly is like the first open source chip. Uh, so that's sort of cool. USB, PicoScope, not open, but there's, you know, I wanted to leave them in here anyway. Some, some specifically open things, SCI Prime and SmartScope, these were I think Kickstarter projects. Uh, and then there's a whole list of other sort of stuff here. But the thing is, what I found with open source hardware, especially when you're working with critical tools like oscilloscope and logic analyzer, which I'll talk about next, you wanna have tools that are actually good. Um, and the problem with open source hardware a lot of times, especially for very difficult products like a scope or like a logic analyzer, is they're not really that good. Um, so you sort of wanna make sure that you invest in something that's gonna actually not lie to you um, and, get, and capture the data that you need. So here's an example, one of the one of the things, this is, this is from some work I did a long time ago um, when I lived in San Francisco, uh, was hacking their smart meter, their smart parking meter, where I'd first moved there and I said, hey, wait a second, they, you know, the parking meters, you put coins in and it adds time to the meter, but you could also buy a smart card of either a $20 or $50 value and um, put it in the meter. The meter would display the current balance of the card and then start deducting money from the card and adding time to the meter. And I'd never worked with smart cards before. I'd wanted to for a long time. And they're just not, smart cards just aren't as pervasive in the States as they are in Europe and other parts of the world. So I just never really had a good opportunity. And this was like, this is a perfect opportunity to start hacking on smart cards right outside my front door. It was perfect. Um, so this one, what I ended up doing is I wanted to monitor the communication between the card and the parking meter. So this board actually had a socket for the card. Down at the bottom, there's a little smart card, um, you know, like uh, footprint that you'd shove into the parking meter. And then in real time, I was capturing all of the communication, which just looked like a lot of, a lot of data coming across. I didn't know what it was yet, um, but once I did all the live captures, yes, on a real parking meter, um, brought it back to my lab and, and printed out all of the screenshots and started to figure stuff out. Um, this type of data, it's, di it's digital data. This is asynchronous serial data, which I'll talk about a little bit later too. Uh, but this is just digital data. So somebody might look at that and say, oh, well, you could just use a logic analyzer for that. It's a lot cheaper. There's lots of open source options, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it turns out that with this communication and the reason the scope is so good is that it can actually show you minute changes in voltage levels as opposed to the logic analyzer, which you'll see basically shows you a one or zero, an on or off. Um, so what I was seeing when I was monitoring the communication is the parking meter signals were like a few millivolts higher than the uh, smart card communications, which were a little few millivolts lower. So I could actually determine by looking at the screenshots who was talking, and that was the key. Um, once I did that, I ended up, there's a whole presentation about this, but I ended up um, first figuring out what the, what the protocol was, uh, which was asynchronous serial data. I had to figure out the baud rate by measuring the, the bit width, which is the shortest amount of time, which I could do with the oscilloscope. My scope has digital decoding functionality, so I could actually see the individual bytes corresponding to that data. Uh, and once I verified that this was the answer to reset, which is like a standard four byte, it's a four byte sequence that smart cards respond with when they're reset. And then I knew that was, part of that corresponded to the manufacturer of the smart card type, which I'd known through some other, some other research. Um, so I basically recreated a tool to replay the entire communication of the card, so to be a card emulator. Um, once I figured out that that worked, just by, man, by, by replaying, and replay attacks are like the oldest trick in the book for security. It shouldn't happen anymore, but it does. Um, once I do the replay attack work, then I spent time figuring out what, in, what the individual bytes were, how the card value was stored, and then modified my code to basically be maximum possible card value with no counter to determine how many times I've used the card, so it would always be you know, unlimited parking. Um, and here's sort of the result of that. <laughs> and so this, this was, uh, um, yeah, five, five years ago or so, I'm holding my then 18-month-old son in one hand, 
camera in the other, and I'm like putting the smart card in the meter. On the street, you can hear the cars going by. And the smart card, it turns out, this was a, oops. Um, this card here, once I had the circuitry done, uh, which used a microchip PIC 16F something or other, um, I went on like a satellite TV hacking website where I got that shim card from, and it turns out that satellite TV pirates have been using microchip PIC devices for a long time for defeating various satellite TV challenge response encryption methods, whatever. Um, so I went and bought a bunch of the smart cards that actually had a PIC in them, and I could program my code onto one of these, and now I had my, my, my emulator on there. So totally cool. But then none of this would have happened without having access to the scope. Um, logic analyzer, oh, by the way, if you have questions, just ask as we go, and then we, maybe we'll have time for questions at the end as well. Um, so logic analyzer, like an oscilloscope, will let you visually see data, um, and it's basically designed to let you see lots of digital data. So a scope maybe goes up to four channels for the most part. Um, logic analyzers usually would be more than four, four, eight, 1632, 76. Um, they originally were, were designed, and they still are used, for monitoring um, you know, address and data buses and control lines and signals between a microcontroller and external peripherals, uh, where you need lots of, lots of data lines to see all of the different stuff, or lots of inputs to see all the different stuff. Uh, but we're only looking, again, at ones and zeros, at highs and lows. So if a signal is above a certain threshold, it's gonna be a high. If it's below a certain threshold, it's a zero. So it sort of is a, you know, it's one level higher than the oscilloscope, because if you, we're not gonna see we're not gonna see very slight variations in signals. But this is what most people getting into hardware hacking are working with, is the, is the logic analyzer. Um, especially when it's used to monitor very simple interchip communication protocols, things like I2C or SPI, that are slow protocols. So it doesn't matter if you have a hobbyist-based scope, because the things that you're usually monitoring are pretty slow. Um, so you're good, you know, and, there, and there's, you're good to go with something that doesn't cost ten thousand uh, dollars. So there are again lots of standalone options, PC-based options. I have this Daily A Logic, which is not really not the hard. I don't think the hardware is open source, though it's been cloned. So, um, but these guys are really focused. It's two brothers that run the company, and I'm not sure if their tool is open source, but they've opened they've opened their API so you can like create your own decoding functionality for it, which is really neat. And they really care about customer response, as opposed to most companies that are like these big companies and don't care if you have a comment. Uh, they have a feature on their website where you can request a feature and then people can vote it up or down. So it's like the more people that wanna have feature X is gonna float to the top and they'll work on that, which is actually really cool. <laughs> yes, there's also open source software that can interact with the Salier. And this is like $99 or something, so a total bargain. Um, SIGROC is the platform. And there's probably other ones too, that this is an open source logic analyzer kind of front end that supports lots of different hardware um, peripherals or devices. And uh, that will give you the logic analyzer screen with various digital decoding functionality to decode different types of data. Open Bench Logic Sniffer is another tool that also would work with, with SIGROC, but this is the hardware portion that's open source. So there are lots of options there. Here's a screenshot, this is like a demo screenshot from the Salier um, page, and this is showing just lots of different channels of lots of different types of, of digital signals. Um, so SPI is a common interchip one, like I mentioned. Uh, one wire is for a single wire interface that makes it easy for certain types of devices. CAN is a controller area network used for car hacking and, and other things, but mostly car hacking, which I'll, I'll talk about. Uh, can decode GPS data asynchronous serial, and you can see the bytes above, so you can set up an actual protocol analyzer within there, or, or protocol decoder, I would say. Um, and it will show you individual bytes, so you don't have to actually try to figure out what the you know, highs and lows are, which makes it a lot easier. Um, one little hack example with a logic analyzer. Um, this is some work that Bunny Wang did back in 2002, but I just love the example for so many reasons. Um, this was something he was working on hacking the original Xbox, and uh, which was uh, basically a PC with some additional security on top. There was like a hidden bootloader that needed a certain key to unlock that bootloader to let certain code run. And he did all sorts of work, but he had to end up creating his own custom logic analyzer, 
which is really neat. Because back in 2002, getting, getting a hold of any logic analyzer was hard. Um, but getting one for the specific bus he was looking at, which is called the hypertransport bus, which was between two chips on the board, the North Bridge and South Bridge on the board. I think it was a 200 megahertz bus, which at the time was like really fast, which still is pretty fast if you actually have to work with it. Uh, th and the bus was actually exposed on the circuit board and there were parallel traces for each data line. It's a differential bus, so you had a positive and a negative for each line. Uh, he had figured out which, you know, which were the data lines and, and address lines and everything. So he built his own tap board that would sit on top of the traces, connect that up to an FPGA, um, field programmable gate array, kind of custom logic to capture all the data and then just dump it out. And then he, was, then he had some tools to help him kind of figure out what that was. So it was like this you know, really neat approach of sometimes you need to create custom tools, and in this case, it, a custom logic analyzer. He found that the secret key was being transmitted across the bus in, in the clear, which is very common with, with hardware devices. Engineers don't think that somebody's gonna actually do that, um, but they do. And so he got the key, and now he was able to load whatever code he wanted on the, on the Xbox. That was sort of neat. Microsoft wasn't really happy with that at first. Um, he wrote a book about it called Hacking the Xbox. That's now free. Um, so if you go to that link, you can get a, a free copy of it. So taking it one level up is Protocol Analyzer. So instead of just seeing analog signals, instead of seeing ones and zeros, we wanna see something even better. Uh, especially when we start dealing with USB interfaces, um, CAN bus, Ethernet, HDMI. It's sort of, when you're dealing with high speed signals, um, logic analyzers aren't necessarily gonna cut it. When you have something like USB that has all these layers of extra crap around it, and if you just wanna see the data that's being sent between two devices, if you, if you had anything at a lower level, you would just, you would, it would be impossible. Um, so protocol analyzers basically um, carve out the important stuff and present it in a way that you can look at the data um, in, in a meaningful manner. And, uh, and it's basically a man in the middle. So you would have a target device on one side, your host on the other, and then your piece of hardware that feeds out to another computer that would monitor everything. As opposed to there are some protocol analyzers that would be like a software tool you would run on your machine to monitor USB or something. Um, but having it in hardware is better because then you avoid any sort of overhead, any sort of latency, any sort of weird driver issue that might not actually be giving you the right data. So having it in hardware is always better. Um, there's an open source tool called OpenVisla that's uh, a USB protocol analyzer. That I think was, somebody had mentioned it to me, it's like the longest undelivered Kickstarter project ever or something like that. Um, where I, I, I think there, it's, some version is released, but it's not the official version yet. Um, and it's a hard thing. I mean, doing some, some of these tools is a very, very ambitious project to try to do as an open source, you know, kind of fun thing. Uh, but that's one for USB. There are commercial tools as well that are, that are more expensive. Project Daisho is, is very promising, uh, made by uh, Michael Osman, who, who made the HackRF, which I'll talk about when we, when we look at software uh, defined radio. Um, and this was his attempt at basically saying, well, there's all these protocol analyzers that exist for legitimate engineers that are thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars that even normal engineers don't buy. They usually rent them for some short amount of time. Um, because you know, to design a system with USB 3, you need to have a way to verify that your data's right. But he's saying, most people don't have that kind of money, most people don't want to spend that kind of money, so let's make an open source, um, high speed protocol analyzer that really works with you know, the highest the most state-of-the-art interfaces, I guess you could say. So this project, uh, he started in 2013, got sidetracked by HackRF, which became a huge Kickstarter success, and he's been supporting that. Um, but little by little, people are, are working on this to create different modules to support different types of high-speed interfaces. So hopefully in the next few years, we'll have a tool that we can use without relying on you know, some of these big closed companies. Here's a... Here's a screenshot of like a typical protocol analyzer where everything is broken out for you. It's, it looks a lot like Wireshark or something. Um, Bus Pirate is another tool uh, that's used for um, interfacing mostly with serial devices or monitoring serial communications between devices. It can be used as a, as a low, very slow logic analyzer with the SIGROC platform. Uh, it has some basic digital decoding through, through that as well. Um, but it's used a lot of times if, you, if you're tinkering around with a chip that has a common serial interface, but you don't want to, want to set up an entire system with it, like you don't want to pull out an Arduino or Raspberry Pi or whatever to start writing code to just test it, 
you can use the bus pirate and just type simple commands to actually communicate with devices. So that's what it started as, is just kind of this evaluation tool. Um, but there's lots of support for all sorts of other device programming and, um, and sniffing buses again and, and working with other types of interfaces. So it's a really cool tool to have, fully open source. You can buy assembled ones for $30 or something, um, but you could always make your own circuit boards and, uh, and, and hand solder them and stuff. So this is a really great hacking tool. Um, so USB to serial adapter. This is one um, that sort of is kind of very needed, um, and there's lots of options, but basically with devices, say like the, like our smart card interface that's asynchronous serial, serial or you know, like old RS-232 interfaces, um, which are basically data signals that don't have an additional clock. So you have like a transmit line and a receive line uh, with no additional clock, so the timing is built into the signal itself. And in order to, to decode the data properly, you need to have the right baud rate which you can do by measuring the, the, again, the bit width, that smallest width um, of, the, of the transaction. So back in the day with RSU32, we'd see lots of control signals being used to, for, for like hardware flow control between different peripherals. But now on systems, we're basically just looking for transmit and receive. And this is a very common thing on embedded systems, especially Linux-based embedded systems, uh, where you typically need some way to administer the device. And engineers and manufacturers want to have physical access to the device so they can connect up to, with their computer and have root shell access, configure the device, test it, whatever they want to do. The, the problem for them, and the good thing for us, is that they never turn those interfaces off. And very rarely, sometimes maybe they'll use a, they'll use a password or something, which there's other tricks to get by. Um, but that interface usually remains on the board. So when we open up a circuit board, we look for these data interfaces, and then we need a way to connect to them. We might even you know, decode the data on our logic analyzer first, but when we want to start actually communicating with the system, we need an interface that will help us do it. Um, so USB to serial adapter, the FTDI FT232 is sort of the core chip that lots of people are using. There's other options as well. And that basically converts logic level zero to three volt signals or whatever it is to a virtual COM port that you plug into your machine and you know, run on whatever, uh, whatever platform you want, whatever, there's drivers for all sorts of different platforms and run your favorite terminal program or screen or whatever, and uh, you can start communicating with the devices. It's very simple, I'll show you, a, I'll show you an example. Um, if you're really interested about how bad it is, uh, these guys, GTV hackers, which are now called exploiteers, if you go to their website, they basically document all of these different devices that they've broken, and a lot of them are based on discovering a UART interface on the board, connecting up with a USB serial adapter and changing some configuration or bypassing something and, and adding some, you know, whatever it is. Now, now they have access to a device on your network and they can do whatever they want because they have root access. And that's like a $5 tool, um, so really worth having. So this example, again, there's many. Um, this is one where a student um, came up to me in one of my classes and said, hey, I have this device, I've heard it's running Linux, can we try to find out if it, you know, where the, where the serial port is. I said, sure. So we went through the same process that, that I talked about at the beginning. Um, you know, we looked at the, opened up the product, looked at the board, looked for interesting interfaces and connectors. Uh, a lot of times, if you have a serial port, you'll also, you'll see transmit and receive, TX and RX, and then you'll also see power and ground, just as a four, a four pin connector, not always, um, but that's sort of what I was looking for on the board. And you see there's like a connector down here that was bigger right next to some flash memory, so I figured that was a memory connector. There's a, some other ones over here near some whatever board that is, I don't know. Uh, but these really stood out, these four connector, unpopulated connectors here right next to that main chip. And I was like, all right, that's sort of interesting. So I used my oscilloscope and we power cycled the board every time we looked at a different pin. Uh, because with Linux, as you know, when it power, things power up, it's just like a dump of data, right? So that's what we were looking for. Uh, and through some trial and error, we found out which was the transmit pin from the chip, because we could see data coming across. We measured the bit width, figured out it was 115.2, and then just assumed that the other pin that wasn't power or ground was received. We hooked up our USB to serial adapter, loaded our terminal program, and then we could power cycle the board and actually see data coming across. So this was like a little a bootloader, and then there was U-boot um, to Un, un, uncompress the file system and load the file system and stuff. But it, we had root access at this point already. 
because you can basically load, you can hit any key to stop auto boot. So you can get into this, stop auto boot, and now you have root access on a device, which is pretty cool. Um, and from a hardware perspective, that's basically game over. That's when the software people start hacking on things. But getting root is, you know, that's really good. Um, so what did you do with that, that setup? What was the goal of that? I don't know what he wanted to do with it. Um, I never asked him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know what, what he wanted to do. Say, when did he add the hair? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Someone else can deal with the hair. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it depends. Like if you wanted to, you know, insert malware or use it as different as have have it execute some other code or maybe extract video streams or I don't know what he wanted to do. But he had total control of the system at that point. Um, so software defined radio. We talked, you know, about interfaces, physical interfaces on a board like that we'd use an oscilloscope or logic analyzer for. There's also lots of devices now that are wireless, thanks to the you know crazy Internet of Things and just lots of Bluetooth devices and lots of devices that are actually transmitting what we sort of call generic RF, which basically is taking data in to a radio transceiver and the radio transceiver modulates it in some way and it just is received by a receiver that demodulates it and uses the data. So it's a very kind of crude transmission form um, using RF, using radio, and we see that a lot in products. So using software-defined radio lets us start working with wireless systems um, in a very cool way. And this is basically where traditionally you'd have a radio that had all of the radio receive functionality and then all the decoding and demodulation and stuff in the, in the hardware. But now because computers are so powerful, you can have, um, you just need the RF front end in hardware and then everything else can be done on the computer in software. Uh, there's a huge open source community around software defined radio and you're basically, you can create your own radios for whatever system you're looking at, which is pretty wild. And HackRF is the main kind of open source hacker tool of choice. Um, an example here is uh, somebody was looking at this wireless home alarm system. And uh, so if any of you have wireless home alarms, I, I don't, but I know I'm going to have to at some point and I'm gonna go through the same process. Is uh, he was curious about you know, what data is being sent by these devices? How is the system actually working? Is it really secure? And should I rely on it to protect my stuff? Uh, so he decided to go down that rabbit hole and see what happened. Um, so he first used uh, a tool called GQRX, which all of these tools I talk about here are actually open source. Um, GQRX is one that's a good visualization tool uh, that you can use with HackRF and it will, actually it's a receiver tool, so it can receive data. Um, he had used that to figure out what frequency the signal was on, what modulation scheme was being used. I'll show you a picture on the next slide. Then he captured all that information, imported it into another visualization tool, and then use something called GNU Radio, which is an amazing tool set that you're basically dragging blocks and creating your own radio. You feed in just a raw radio signal and you can filter the data, demodulate it with different schemes, because there's all sorts of different ways that a radio signal is kind of manipulated as it's sent over the air. And then turn it back into binary data and stuff. So he did this, this crazy project. Um, there's actually some people at, uh, at a recent Dorkbot meeting at, um, at Bunk Bar who were messing around with, with HackRF. Um, Jared Boone, I think he's actually here somewhere, uh, is a, it helps Michael Osman work with HackRF and uh, he, he's a pro at this stuff and I just watched him one day like dragging blocks around. Somebody brought in a wireless temperature sensor and he went through the same process of moving all these blocks and figuring out the transmission frequency and all this stuff and by the end of the night, he could actually see the bytes corresponding to the temperature sent from the temperature sensor. Uh, so really neat. So here's, you can like visualize the data, the radio signal and see, oh, this is a, maybe a two FSK where you have two frequencies, one for zero, one for one, I think it is. Um, and you can start decoding and create this whole system. So just crazy. Um, okay, oh, 10 minutes. Where'd the time go? Um, all right, so that was sort of looking at signals and then we'll talk about kind of manipulating systems and manipulating signals, even though, you know, there's some overlap. Um, so soldering iron, uh, not traditionally open source, I guess, but sort of needed a lot of times for connecting things to boards. I did actually find a, uh, a, an open source driver board that will take like a kind of a dumb soldering heating element and create like a temperature controlled soldering iron out of it, which is kind of neat. Some soldering accessories 
that I like to use, desoldering tools, things for cleaning up traces and, and sucking out solder, molten solder from holes. Um, chip quick, again, not an open source thing, but I thought really cool, and I, I wanted to show a fun video of it, because a lot of people, when they open up circuit boards, a lot of components nowadays are called surface mount, where they're small, and they're mounted on, on the surface of the board, on one side of the board, um, as opposed to older devices, which are through hole, which go through the board, and you would solder them on the underside. So surface mount devices are a lot harder to work with, and it scares a lot of people away when they're starting to work with hardware. Um, so this, this, this product called ChipQuick, um, which was just created by one guy in his, in his house, and he goes around the country like demoing this stuff at, at trade shows, it's really cool, uh, helps you remove surface mount parts from boards. So if you do want to hack on something, you don't need a crazy rework station to do it. You can use a $15 tool and pull the part off, and I'll show you the video of it. And it basically is like a, 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 a low melting point alloy, like, a, like solder, but a different composition than solder that will, that will melt with the solder and then lower the, lower the melting point of all of the solder on the board and make the part, um, make the, everything will stay molten longer to give you time to actually get the part off the board. So here's a, wish you had run this at double speed. I moved too slow. So I basically put some flux on, which is like a chemical compound that helps with heat transfer and with cleaning the, the surface oxides off of things. So now I'm putting down this chip quick, which looks just like normal solder, just a little bit thicker. I'm just putting it on all of the pins and everything is still molten and it just pushed the part off, so it's pretty cool. And that's like, that's a 20 pin um, SSOP package, really fine pitch, really hard to work with normally. Um, so rework stations are another way that you can remove parts and, and put parts on board, uh, reflow ovens and things like that. A lot of very expensive options. Some people remove parts with like a cooking skillet. Uh, there are lots of people now that have created these open source controllers to use with a standard toaster oven. So you'd buy a toaster oven, use this controller, and it will actually be a reflow oven that follows a certain reflow profile for the solder to let you solder parts on and also to heat up the board so you can like take components off. Pretty neat. Um, okay, other ways. I talked about memory where we want to try to extract things from memory on these types of devices. So a device programmer is one way to do that. It's basically general purpose device programmer is just a device, is a tool that can support lots of different memory devices. You put piece of memory in, maybe you have to take it off of the circuit board. Sometimes you can just tap right onto the lines on the board, uh, put that into a programmer, run a tool, and it will just suck all of the contents out for you in a binary form that you would then need to go and you know, figure out what to do with, uh, which would usually you'd disassemble it or you'd look at a binary or, or something like that. Um, and most memory is totally insecure, so there's, uh, there's lots of options. The ones I list here are, are standard commercial ones. This one company has this open API so you can write your own chip uh, algorithm if it doesn't support the chip you want. Um, but there are lots of other projects, say if you encounter an Atmel AVR or a microchip PIC. Like there are open source projects that you can build a specific programmer for a specific chip. I just didn't list them because there's millions of them out there. It mostly don't use it, yeah. So there's a security bit on some devices that will prevent you from reading contents of data out, but most people don't use them. If they do, there's ways to defeat them, but that's like a totally different, um, usually chip level types of, types of access. So this particular, sorry? Is there a way for the computer to use? Yeah, if it's like a physically, if it's physically blown on the device, then you can decap the chip, find the fuse and repair it, but it's easier said than done, yeah. Sometimes what people do is, is find another way to, to dump the memory of like loading a little program in if they can that's allowed access to the chip because the bits usually prevent external access but not internal access from some, some other program running. So then that program could read the contents and spit it out like a serial port or blink a light or something for you know ones and zeros. So hacker specific tools, uh, again, mo these are mostly for game consoles for extracting different types of flash memory. If you have a normal device programmer, it's just you know, easier, uh, but these are very open source and very, I mean, this is, soldering all those wires to test points makes my eyes cross. Um, let's see, what else? So debug tools, this is, a, this is a really kind of deep subject, but basically we wanna try to find interfaces on the board that 
are for engineers and manufacturers for programming chips, for testing their devices. So debug ports are basically functionality built into the chips themselves that if you have the correct hardware, you can connect up to them and extract data, single step through a device just like you would with a normal debugger, you know, with GDB or something. Um, and vendors usually leave those enabled because it makes their job easier. And uh, if we can find those, we can use all sorts of different tools to actually start messing with them. Um, I'm gonna skip, I'm gonna skip these, so, this example, but this is basically using standard off-the-shelf development tools uh, against a car electronic control unit to pull out firmware and send to my friends that were hacking cars. Mm -hmm. And um, these slides will be up on my website when I get home, so in an hour or two, I'll put them up. There's an older version of this, of this, of these slides on my site, but I'll put this one up so you can, so you can see more about this and you know, watch the video and stuff. Uh, so JTagulator is a, a tool that I created which helps you find these types of debug interfaces because it still is this sort of, there's this, this, this kind of um, learning curve of, of how to find these connections and even once you find them, how do you know which connections are the right ones to use for your debug hardware? So I built a tool that will uh, let you do that. You can hook up to 24 unknown test points on a circuit board and it will uh, basically enumerate and try all the different possible permutations of pinout to give you the right one. Then you can hook up normal um, debug hardware to that and start manipulating things. And I have an example here of like using a WRT54G, a Linksys access point, like a really popular one to hack on. Um, just hooked up wires, ran some commands, which you can't really see here, and it will tell me the pinout, and then I could hook up other hardware and start dumping memory and single stepping and stuff. So lots of tools, again, just like with the logic analyzer, there's lots of open source, kind of very basic hardware platforms, and then the, the software is really where the key is. Um, so the Bus Blaster is the one that I use for JTAG, which is an industry standard debug interface. Tons of other ones. From the software side, usually people are using OpenOCD or URJTAG, both open source projects that basically once you have that pinout for, especially for JTAG interface, which is the most common, um, besides vendor specific kind of proprietary interfaces that you would just use their standard development tools for. This one, um, OpenOCD will give you GDB functionality, GDB support for devices, so now you can single step, set registers, jump over code, modify things however you want, which is awesome. And then URJTAG, similar types of stuff let you manipulate the device, extract memory and things. I have an example of a, a friend of mine who hacked an ATM, which I won't go into the details, but he had used JTAG as one of the first steps to connect up to the device, it was Windows CE, load, um, load explorer.exe into it using OpenOCD, um, basically having it boot and read explorer.exe from a, from a thumb drive. Now he could browse the file system and found all sorts of problems and ended up being able to like dump, send money out of the, out of the money slot and stuff. So yeah, you can check that out on your own. It was totally cool. The ATM vendor was pissed. He actually, he actually waited a year to, uh, to release that talk so the vendor could fix the problems. It was, there were so many problems with it. He could remotely update new firmware to the device. Wow. It was scary, yeah. Um, so Binwalk is a software tool that lets you analyze firmware, so once you do extract data contents from memory, you can run it through Binwalk, which will help you take a guess at what architecture it is, um, if things are compressed or encrypted. It can carve out data chunks. You can do something like, the example here is, it will scan the image and tell you like, oh, this block from this address to this address is a GIF, or this is a bitmap, or this is whatever, and it can carve out all the in individual pieces uh, that you can then use for, for reverse engineering. Uh, and then another, some other software stuff, disassembly, once you have your binary, and you run it through Binwalk, and you go, oh, that's a x86 architecture, or that's ARM, then you need a way to look at program code and go down that path of, of kind of software hacks at that point. Um, so IDA is the tool of choice, not open source. Um, so there are now some options. Radar 2, I just learned about last week, I was at a conference in Montreal, that is basically trying to provide a platform that's as good, if not better, than IDA, so people actually have a choice to not have to use IDA, um, you know, and have an open source platform. Because if you give a talk about reverse engineering and you expect everybody paid $1,000 for that tool, like, that's not really that great, right? People can't replicate your work if they have to pay $1,000 to even enter into it. So Radar 2, Capstone are, are some examples there. 
Um, let's see, yeah, I just have a few more, few more pieces. GoodFet is sort of like the bus pirate, so another kind of very um, open, very cheap, so you can get one of these boards, build one yourself. That lets you interface with different types of devices. This actually lets you reprogram um, certain types of microcontrollers. So one example here is using a good FET as a device programmer to reprogram the firmware inside of this thing, which is the IME. It's like a little two-way pager um, designed for teenage girls a long time ago that failed miserably. Uh, but now it's like a great hacker tool. Has a, a ChipCon uh, chip in it, which is like a wireless chip with an 8051 core. And Travis Goodspeed created the GoodFet and had a bunch of tools. And then Sammy uh, uh, Comcar, who's a very cool hardware hacker, modified, added new code to basically have it be a universal garage door opener for wireless systems. Um, let's see, so we have three more pieces. So Face Dancer, if you want to start manipulating USB drivers on a host, this basically pr can pretend to be any sort of USB device. So if you're looking at a product that expects you to plug a USB key into it, what if you're like, oh, what happens if I pretend to plug in a, a mouse or a camera or anything else? And you can even send incorrect USB data and try to have the drivers fail or have the system fail. And that's part of, part of hardware hacking is like getting the system to behave in a way that it wasn't intended to, right? So if there's some error checking not done properly, we can take advantage of that. The Dot and Kraka is, uh, an open source platform, sort of a generic platform to let you do all sorts of manipulation of systems. Um, put together by some guys as a, I think it was Dimitri's um, PhD, part of his PhD project. They still have a lot of work to do on it and they do te teach some classes about how to use it. Um, but it's for, you know, basically serving as a tool to do a lot of the functions that we talked about. And the final product, we're getting more towards advanced kind of techniques, specific techniques as opposed to just monitoring and, and kind of working with signals, now it's like really manipulating devices. So the Chip Whisperer, and now the Chip Whisperer Lite, um, put together by Colin O'Flynn as his PhD project, and he basically took a very complicated, complex process that was only really talked about in academia and moved it to the hacker community with this open source tool set, um, which basically takes advantage of something called side channel, which, are, which is the fact that electronic devices leak information unintentionally. Uh, so like for a, during a cryptographic operation, he can measure the chain, minute changes in power consumption and actually extract the cryptographic key that's being used for the operation. So that's been used across tons of smart cards. It's been broken, it's broken all sorts of systems using side channel. And um, that's, so now he makes it easy for anybody to do it. And it can also do um, timing attacks and glitching attacks of basically forcing a system to like skip over an instruction or to, to, uh, to operate incorrectly outside of its guaranteed parameters. So very, very cool platform. There's a video here that, will, that you can watch on your own about glitching. So I guess kind of as a summary, I know that was a lot um, in 45 minutes, um, but sort of what now? Uh, if you haven't already, you know, try to take a look at some of these tools and just start tinkering with things. Get pieces of hardware that people might be throwing out um, you know, a little free cycle action, get some of those, open it up, see what's going on, see if you can identify um, interesting connectors on the board, maybe get a bus pirate and start sniffing around and just experiment. There's lots of historical work, so you can learn from history and really check out, uh, you know, some of the very, very kind of common types of attacks and kind of use those and experiment. And uh, if you're on the design side, then you can also use these tools to make sure your security is actually, you know, what you promise to, to your, to your Customers. Um, so that's it. Thank you. I guess that's 45 minutes. Do we have any time for questions? No, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm.